Hello to you. How's it going? <laughs> it's going well. Thank you very much for doing this. Of course. Happy to be back. All right. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I want to introduce this woman to you. She is the director of a series called Songs You Don't Know by Heart. And this is a video series. I think it's been one of the audio visual events of the year. It's been very excited, unprecedented kind of thing. And the concept is very simple. It features the acoustic performances of singer songwriter, Jimmy Buffett, along with a little bit of backstory, the story behind the tale. And so I'm, ple I'm pleased to welcome the mysterious woman behind the camera, Delaney Buffett. She has been called a brilliant storyteller who brings a human element to what she does. If you like this interview, go back and listen also to episode number three. We are now at episode 489. So Delaney Buffett, thank you so much for coming back. Thank you for having me. I'm super excited to be here and, and chat about the project. And those were very kind words. Um, I don't think I've gotten that kind of introduction before. So I really appreciate it. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. So tell me, why did you want to do this? What about this particular project was compelling to you? Sure. So um, it wasn't, so the genesis of the idea and the origin were actually sort of a combination of um, two guys that work for my dad, um, Rob and Dylan. They had this idea to sort of tweet out during the beginning of the pandemic, you know, what are some songs you don't know by heart that you love? And they sort of did it just for fun. And they got such an overwhelming response from fans that they wanted to do something with it. So we sort of came together and had this idea to do a video series um, where they would present um, him with a bunch of these songs that they kind of pulled, pulled all the numbers together to see which were the favorites. Um, and so my dad kind of picked and cho chose from there um, what he wanted to sing and do. And he definitely hit most of the um, higher, you know, requests. Um, but he also sort of some of his old favorites that he wanted to revisit, he, he included in there as well. So that's sort of the origin story of it. And I think, you know, we wanted to keep it simple. Um, and I don't like being on camera. So that was natural for me to just be behind camera <laughs> um, and sort of uh, have him, you know, lead the show as he does, because he is the, prof the professional of the two of us. So um, we wanted to keep it intimate and sort of just him and his guitar and me and an iPhone um, and a tripod sometimes, sometimes not. But I think simplicity was the key to it because I think we wanted it to feel, uh, the audience to feel that they sort of were in the room with him. So we didn't want any bells and whistles to sort of interrupt that intimacy. Well, I appreciate you going on camera, even though you don't <laughs> like being on camera. And I'll, I'll make a confession. I'm, I'm pretty uncomfortable being on camera myself. I'm, I always feel like an audio guy. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's uncomfortable for me. I mean, you, uh, yeah. <laughs> I, think, I think most people are uncomfortable on camera, but I think Zoom probably has maybe made people more comfortable seeing themselves since the majority of meetings and, you know, things like this are taking place on there. So I've gotten a little bit more comfortable on a, in, in a Zoom, probably not in front of a huge camera on a set. <laughs> hmm. Well, I think it's important when, you know, when I think I heard this, I think Larry King said this, he said, if you're interviewing somebody and you get nervous, try telling them that you're nervous. And it's like, you suddenly it's like I'm not nervous anymore yeah yeah <laughs> no I think that's true I think anytime you admit you're nervous or uncomfortable I think it like disarms you and the person so I think it's like a good tactic for sure you know there were a lot of people that said this about songs you don't know by heart I saw this again and again people said and I'm quoting exactly one person but I saw other people say something like this the best thing he ever did. Was this. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's my, one of my, I mean, obviously I'm biased, but I think it's definitely one of my favorite things he did. I think, you know, myself, I wasn't familiar with his older catalog. And I think a lot of people don't 
know the extent of his songwriting um, because the more popular songs, and I think he, you know, he sort of talked about that and we've talked about that too. So I think it's great that he explored the catalog a bit more and put it on social media. So it's more available for people, right. Who don't want to go digging through Spotify and, and try to find songs on their own. Um, if they're not as familiar with his work. So I think for me, it was a convenient way to learn a bit more about him and, um, his process now versus then. And, you know, I think with my favorite musicians, I think my favorite thing, you know, I love tiny desk concert Hmm. on NPR. I think like that's one of the greater shows on YouTube. And, you know, I think it is the intimacy and like the stripped down music that makes people, it makes that show so popular. And I think, you know, anytime you pair um, storytelling or backstory with that sort of, you know, stripped down um, musical setting, it, it even makes it that more intimate. And I think I love hearing and knowing what inspires a song. I think that's like one of the coolest things. Um, Cause sometimes it can be a really cool specific moment or story, or sometimes, you know, it, admittedly so it's just like, oh, I thought it was a, you know, a catchy um, phrase and it sort of like turned into something from there. So I think regardless, it's interesting always to find out how something was made i'm a guy i like to do my research and yeah. I, i'm gonna give different shout outs to things that i either read or listened to i want to give credit where credit is due i listened to something called the margaritaville podcast oh uh, yeah hakey hosted, does that yeah hakey larson correct yeah. and you talk a little bit about the music that you like to listen to. What's what you play on Spotify or Apple music or whatever. And I'm curious about this because when I think about like when I was just a wee guy, a little kid, I have really vivid memories of my mom playing certain things. Like I remember Julio Iglesias and the Willie Nelson, Julio Iglesias to all the girls I've loved before. Mm -hmm. So around the Buffett house, maybe just playing on the speakers early on, what can you remember the family listening to, or maybe a memory that you have of something that your mom or dad would play? Sure. That's a great question. Um, I mean, so there was always, uh, I think this is not surprising. And there was a lot of Bob Marley always. Um, <laughs> and then my dad really loves any sort of, you know, like music, like music from the Caribbean or Africa. Um, he loves, and I can't think of the specific van, bands, unfortunately, but there was always that sort of music from all over the world. Like he loves, you know, a very, he's a very eclectic taste, but I know he would always put songs on. And there's this one song that he would always play that I loved. And I'm going to look it up right now because Go for I'm it. really listening to it in the car once. I'm going to tell you an apologies. Oh, no it was worries. Bongo Bong by Manu Chow. Okay. I think that's what it was. Yeah. And I remember, so he always kind of, which was great because, right, I, I'm not a music snob at all. I like all kinds of music, any kind. I like mainstream on the radio. I love old music. So my sister and dad always had really, really good taste in music and always had great finds. So, like, he sort of educated me more on world music. Um and my sister was really in tune with reggae, but also classic rock. And she would make me um, CDs, like burnt CDs with everything. Like, you know, I'm trying to think what was on this one CV, CD. It was like Stevie Wonder, like Sly and the Family Stone. But then like more current tracks as well, but like the Eagles or you know, some of her like more obscure indie rock at the time, which would have been the 90s. So I, I was fortunate enough to be exposed to like a lot of different music. And I think it's definitely influenced my taste now because I do skew to like older things. That being said, though, like I listen to techno music. I, li I listen to top 40. Um, I don't discriminate. Um, but yeah, I think having, you know, I didn't play. I played piano. I wasn't very musical. Um, but I always love music. I love making playlists. And I like think that I definitely have, 
my parents and my sister to thank for the exposure to all different kinds of music, or I think I probably would just listen to Top 40 all the time. <laughs> you know, some of the comments that people said, they they were really touching. I mean, I didn't make this thing, and I was touched by some of the things people were saying. Like, uh, I wrote this in, in the review, but there was a guy named Mikey, and he said that he was playing... I guess on his iPad, the peanut butter conspiracy episode at the assisted living home that his dad lived. And mm -hmm. he said his dad was tapping his feet and kind of like singing along. Did you read a lot of the comments that people made about this series? I did. So I, I have recently taken a break from social media. So prior to that, I read all of them and they were super heartwarming to read. And I did love I remember reading that and I remember um, reading a few others that spoke about, you know, familial bonds or, you know, like when they first bought the album or when they first became a fan. So, yeah, I think it's always it's a, you know, I think social media is a double edged sword where I think, unfortunately, nowadays you can, <laughs> there's a lot of negative comments out there. So when you dive into something, you're like, oh, man, what am I going to see? But I was pleasantly surprised. Um with all the positivity. And I think it was something that made the experience that much better was, you know, to hear everyone else's stories and how it resonated with them. Um, so it kind of went beyond um, sort of the web series um, format. And I think, you know, the best thing about, um, you know, making things or sharing things with people is relatability in my opinion. Um, I think, you know, when someone can see something and it, you know, stirs up a memory or a moment or it's something like oh you know who would love this my dad you know who would love this you know my friend from college so I think like you know it's great that people were able to connect with it in that way and and I was happy that I I got to see everyone's comments because they were super moving and, and very nice and couldn't have been um more sweet to read and and what was I think you know a very tough time for everyone mm-hmm yeah, it was a total love fest. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no 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 bickering or anything. Everybody everybody pretty much unanimously loved, you know, it was like there was no maybe there was a couple of times where people would be like, "Oh man, my song didn't make the list." <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> <You know>? yeah. <laughs> and I wanted to be like, "Well, I, I can't I mean like, yeah, I know." And I yeah. I knew most of the song beforehand. I we, you know, we shot the majority of it, um a good chunk of it in March. So I knew sort of the majority of the song lesser we knew, but there were a couple that we snuck in there at the end and recorded um, once we sort of knew how many we wanted. In the, the Why Know and I Know episode, you mentioned in particular, you said, I really like this song. Mm -hmm. And it is a really, it's a very clever song, some really interesting turn of lyrics in there. But so much of it centers around New Orleans, and I'm hoping you can tell the viewers out there sure. your memory of the first time you went to New Orleans. So I, I think it would probably, so I've spent a lot of time in New Orleans in my adult life too. Um, but as a child, I think it would probably be, and I have a terrible memory, but I think it would probably be Jazz Fest. And there's a photo that we put in there and it's with, um, my godfather and my dad's other friend is actually my brother's godfather. And it's the th him, those two friends of my dad and me in overalls. And while I can't remember that memory, my mom was like, that was a jazz fest. Mm -hmm. But I do remember jazz fests later in life. And I think like that was my only memory of New Orleans was going um, and seeing him perform there. But I um, spent a lot of time, I had friends in New Orleans um, when I was in college, so I kept going to Jazz Fest and Mardi Gras, and I eventually worked down there. Um, so, you know, I, I spent probably like a, a few months, a few weeks at a time working down there, and I love it. I think it's definitely one of my favorite cities um, in the country, and I've only had, you know, I've had wonderful experiences there. I think Jazz Fest is the, the greatest music festival <laughs> <laughs> in terms of just like, it has such, you know, 
a range of artists and music that you wouldn't see anywhere else. And then you have the after shows and you have the food. And, you know, I've had friends come down for Jazz Fest too. And just the architecture of New Orleans, it doesn't, it doesn't feel like you're in the U.S. at all. It feels like you've just gone to this alternate world. And I think that's what I love about it. But my dad loves it definitely more than I do. But I think <laughs> he has more of a soft spot for it because of the amount of time he spent there. But he goes back there a lot. Um, and I think I loved that song because I love New Orleans, but I also think I like any song with a story. I don't mm. know, like I think, you know, the you know, I, I think that song, you know, Death of an Unpopular Poet, I just like that they have a through line and maybe that's because, you know, you know, I'm aspiring to be a writer as well. And I think like, it's really hard to tell a good story, especially in three minutes with the musical accompaniment. So I think um, I just appreciate when people are able to do that. And that's like my favorite songs are ones I can decipher almost immediately. Like, Oh, I know what this is about. And I think hmm. obscurity too in music is great as well. But I think for some reason I'm like, Oh, I love that this has like a story and I can tell almost immediately it's about X, Y, or Z. Well, you're tapping into something interesting here on the Chanson pour les petits enfants. Please forgive me, everybody. I can't say it. <laughs> I <got> there, so. <laughs> we'll say chanson. Yeah. Uh, on that one, there's the the song itself is a, is a story, but mm -hmm. then you taped and you asked the questions and he gave you the backstory behind it. And I thought, wow, the song hasn't even begun and I'm enchanted by it. And with you in your own writing, what would you say that your father, one of the premier storytellers in the world, has taught you about storytelling? <laughs> I have to think mine, I'm going to say. I mean, I think, I think that, you know, he tells a great story, and I think it's a lot about the characters and I think he creates very interesting great characters you know like one of his favorite authors is Carl Hyacin and who's a, obviously like a Florida bias because of the Florida connection too but I think <laughs> once you have a great character super interesting with a funny name and a good backstory the story sort of can ride on their back obviously you need a good plot um the people aren't gonna follow along with a character that they don't like. And I think you can have an anti-hero like Breaking Bad, but there's a reason why you like that character so much. So I think it's definitely like, even in the stories that he tells at the dinner table, there's always a character at the center of it. And there's a lot of detail surrounding that person. So I think, you know, he might not have, he, I don't know if he's explicitly said that, but when we talk about writing and stuff, he always very much focuses like first on the story. He also is very good with clever titles and names. Um, I don't think I fully inherited that. So I often go to him if I'm trying to think of a snappy title for something, but yeah, character work is certainly at the center of his work. And I hope that, you know, it will be at the center of mine. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you, it's almost like you're reading down some of my notes here because it seems like whatever you yeah. say, it leads into the next point. That I'm, I glad, I'm glad. I love a good transition. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're, you're just setting them up and, and hopefully we're knocking them out. But um, <laughs> you mentioned the, the sitting around telling stories and I was listening. I took a walk today and I listened to this podcast. It was very interesting. And I believe the name of the podcast is uh, Stories, uh, Stories We Could Tell mm -hmm. that you did. Yeah. Yes, I did do that one. Yeah. And in it, he goes and he talks about about Key West, the the, the host of this show. Yes, and you were mentioning it. You didn't have that much experience with Key West, but you have a, quite a quite an experience having lived in Florida. Yeah. One time, I was talking to this this uh, this singer songwriter Elizabeth Cook is her name, and we were talking about how sh she's from Florida originally. And when you say that somebody is from Florida. That could truly mean anything. It could, yeah. Yes. Yeah. It could be that you wear cowboy boots and a cowboy hat. Yeah. It could, it could mean that you're, you know, an investment banker. It could mean that you're a busker on the street. I mean, it, it could mean anything. Very true. Yeah. 
how do you define Florida? What, do, what does Florida mean to you? Man, that's tough. Um, I don't, I mean, <laughs> I think, you know, there was a quote my dad gave in one of the um, interviews about Key West specifically, you know, and if you, everyone, if you shook out America or whatever, everyone ends up down there eventually. I think it's interesting to me because it doesn't, like you said, there isn't, I think people love to make the Florida man jokes, right? Where like you put in your birthday and like a date and it says some crazy thing that happened in Florida. But I think it's difficult to define it, right? Because like you said, it, it's so interesting because it's a lot of snowbirds or, you know, people who have lived there their entire lives, but it's so undefinable to me. And I know that's a cop out situation, but just having lived there, I think I lived in a very specific part of Florida. Um, and I think, you know, South Florida is, I think, more an extension of the Northeast in a way. Um, in terms of just a lot of the people I knew there. I mean, I think anytime I mention where I'm from, people are like, oh, my grandparent lives there. Or, oh, my grandparent lives there. So I think it's a lot of retirees, but I also think, you know, I've spent some time in near Tampa and I think it's, you know, the diversity in landscape and, you know, there are these beautiful beaches, but it also has all this wildlife and, sort of craziness to it that I think it is and I'm rambling here undefinable <laughs> in terms of like you know I think I associate it with my childhood in the beach um and warm weather um but as I go back there I, I think it's and as I read articles and I read these Florida man things, I kind of think like, you know, Texas is a weird place too, if you could think about it sometimes in terms of like I think people sometimes group Texas and Florida in a similar way and that they're just strange and strange things happen. And, but I think, um, you know, Texas is the lone star state and I think it hasn't, you know, like a rich history of cowboys. And, but I think Florida is just kind of like, it, there's no, <laughs> there's no way I think it's similar to yeah. Texas to be like, this is, this is what it is because I think it's such a hodgepodge of, you know, cultures and communities um that I got to explore a little later in life I think my world was very very small and then once I got to sort of um see what else Florida had to offer I was like wow you know like even though you know I grew up on the east coast the west coast of Florida is just totally different mm -hmm. you know <laughs> and even the way it looks the beaches um I was I forget where I was but it was it was closer to the gulf coast but like it just had these beautiful sprawling white beaches and I was like wow this looks nothing like you know, South Florida. Um, but yeah, and I rambled and I'm sorry if that was not a good answer, but it was a tough question. <laughs> it, it is a tough question. I yeah. don't know. I don't know if I could have answered. I mean, <laughs> what I, I was thinking as I, as I was thinking about the question, as I was walking today, I thought, and you said unnameable, I think, or something. Undefinable. Uh, undefinable. That's yeah. what you said. And I was thinking, how would I say what Florida is. I mean, oh, I, I bet you have a better answer than I do. <laughs> well, we'll see. I lived in Florida once. I mean, everybody lives in Florida at least once, but yeah. <laughs> I would say unknowable. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that's true. That yeah. Florida. I mean, it's like you could, you could go to a party and meet, you know, somebody who just got out of prison and also <laughs> like, I mean, just anything. Yeah. You know, it's it's anything. true. In the love in the library episode, I really liked that because it's a rare song and I always thought that was a really, a really overlooked song, which a lot of these songs are, but it made me wonder, Delaney, what is your favorite book? Oh, my favorite book. Or a favorite book. Um, a favorite book. I love Count of Monte Cristo. I think that's one of my favorite books. Um, and that's something I revisited during quarantine. And then one that I read in quarantine as well, that's a newer version, is Where the Crawdads Sing, um, which is really good. But I don't know, I, I love a mystery, and both of those have that element to it. 
Um, the first one's a bit more vengeful, but I love Count of Monte Cristo. And I think I read that when I was, you know, like, I think probably like 14 and it always stuck with me um, because I just thought it played out so brilliantly. And I love, you know, um, what's the word? It's, it's skipping redemption. I love like a good redemptive moment. And that's sort of story you know I don't like when the bad guy I know it's real and it's more realistic when the bad guy wins but I do like when <laughs> you know there is some redemption in a story so yeah I think that would probably be one of my favorite books I I agree with you I mean redemption is probably I mean that's the the greatest thing in human existence <laughs> yeah. is redemption yes other than you made me think maybe it's because we're getting towards dinner time a Monte Cristo sandwich not the book, but <laughs> very good. They're very good. Yeah, <laughs> they can be wonderful. They can be very good. Yeah. Well, you again, you're just setting these up for me. Great. In the peanut butter conspiracy. Mm -hmm. I think you could make a case. I, I would be willing to maybe go on a game show and say this. I believe that there is no singer songwriter in American music who has mentioned more specific types of food in his songs, meals, <laughs> I, I swear, I, I, I'm probably not the first one who says this, but Jimmy Buffett has written more songs that mention different meals or restaurants or whatever. So again, I would ask Delaney, what mm -hmm. is your all-time favorite meal? Oh, man. That would be a really good Jeopardy question. <laughs> Yeah. Um, not that one, but who is, you know, reference food most. I think, again, this is a difficult one. My favorite meal. Ugh, like I want to, like it, honestly, it's I'm trying to think. I love Italian food, so I want to default to pizza, but I'm not going to be that boring. Um, <laughs> I think I would have to say, I like, like if I could pick a meal in terms, I really like comfort food. So I would think it would be if health wasn't an issue constantly um, <laughs> and I could have a, a calorie free meal, it would definitely be like a chicken with uh, mac and cheese, a Caesar salad and like mashed potatoes, just all of the comfort food on one plate. Hmm. Like if I'm feeling like hungover or, <laughs> you know, out of touch, or out of place, I think I, I always default to that kind of food. Um, and maybe that's like the child in me that just wants <laughs> like the buttered noodles. <laughs> I contend that you can learn a lot about somebody by what their favorite meal is. Yeah. Well, I hope, I don't know what that means, but I, I hope it, <laughs> I hope it's not, but I agree. I mean, you can tell. <laughs> well, that's why I want to go. <laughs> you, you said that's why what now? Oh, I so said that's why I didn't want to default to pizza. Ah, I think every, I, I don't think it's a bad slice of pizza. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, a, a lot of people would concur. Yeah. In the something so feminine about a mandolin, that was interesting because there's a cameo from your mm -hmm. mom. She calls in, and I know she's a private person, but. Is she a creative person? How would you define your mom? Um, my mom is very funny um, and very, very smart. I, I would say she's a creative person just in the, I think she would, if I, she was like, no, I'm not. But I think, you know, I would say she's probably an equally compelling storyteller as my dad in terms of sitting at a table and telling a story she's very good um so I would venture to say that she would probably say no I'm not that creative but maybe she would depending on the day but I think that she is definitely a creative person um I think she has an act for storytelling too I don't think she expresses it in songwriting even though I thought that she did a great job with something so feminine <laughs> um but no I would say she's creative and, and very smart and um very knowledgeable, wise person. Hmm. Yeah. Earlier in our interview, you were mentioning the song Death of an Unpopular Poet. 
Mm-hmm. And you were you were mentioning how it's it's got such a great storytelling element to it. And you're not alone there. It's one of my favorites. And I know that Bob Dylan, one of the greatest songwriters ever, has said that that's one of his favorite songs. And I'm curious to know from you, do you think that the party songs of Jimmy Buffett, in a way, the, or the like the celebratory stuff, has it kind of overshadowed in some ways the more serious songs? Because it's interesting to me, the songs that people really wanted to hear, they're more serious and sometimes kind of, you know, emotional, wistful sometimes. Yeah, I, I definitely think they do. I mean, I think that I remember um, I had a teacher in school and high school. My dad came and spoke to what we had, were taking some sort of history class and he came and spoke and my, gosh, I think it was English class, but he came and spoke and he was talking about escapism generally and how my dad spoke to escapism, especially like post Vietnam um, and post-war escapism. And I think that like, I always kind of, that always kind of stuck with me because I think those songs, the party songs are so fun to listen to and they are such a method of escapism. You know, you can put them on, they've almost like had now a built-in connotation with like sitting on a beach, I think for a lot of people and whether that's because they've done an excellent job with branding, I don't know. (laughs) But (laughs) I think that people default to those, but I do think that the same way, I think with a lot of musicians, the more upbeat popular ones that are more sort of would be in your face and, and, and more popular and like, great. Like I'm listening to this and having a wonderful drive would overshadow the more, you know, soulful, sad, um, ones that take a little bit more patience to listen to and to understand. Um, so I definitely think they overshadow it. Not to say that I don't enjoy them as well, but I think there's some real gems in there that, you know, people who wouldn't be sort of, like I said, familiar with his songwriting would be sort of, you know, very impressed with his storytelling ability and his, you know, younger self writing these songs alone, which I think was the case for a lot of um, songwriters back then. But um, I do think it overshadows. And I think it is sometimes because those types of songs do require a bit of patience. And I also think artists sort of have to gain, at least for me, like a sense of trust in a way too, where I'm listening to all their popular songs. I'm like, oh, I really like these. And then I'll go back and sort of dive deeper. And I'm like, these are amazing too. So I would say like, what's interesting is they're sort of like, you know, the front page for him in terms of like what might draw people in. Um, But once you dig a bit deeper, it's almost like you go from a tropical rock to just a more, which he admits too, it was his folk phase, like a folksy songwriter phase that people sort of, I don't think really associate with unless you're like a deep cut, you know, longtime fan. Hmm. Very well put. <laughs> the last time we talked, there was something that you said. It was it was really interesting. We were talking about these different Hollywood cliches. And you were saying many, many times someone's persona is very different than the person. Mm-hmm. In what way do you think that your father is perhaps different from the beach party man that people commonly would think of um he's shy which I think probably is hard to think because he has like a stage presence but he's very shy um and I can say that because I think I um have (laughs) I think I inherited some of that shyness but he's um he's shy but he's I think there was an article in the New York Times that came out that was like, Jimmy Buffett doesn't live the Jimmy Buffett lifestyle or something like Mm -hmm. that. And he is probably, despite his, you know, like he does, I will say he's incredibly authentic in that like he serves, he loves to fly. He loves to sail. He loves the beach. He loves the ocean. He loves food. (laughs) Food is a big thing in our house, but I think 
people probably, you know, might associate him with like, you know, drinking a margarita on the beach, hanging out with his feet, feet up. His feet are, are rarely up. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, he's a very, very diligent hard worker. And from what I have heard, it's always been that way. So I think he's never not wanting to be busy and, and do things. And, you know, he's an incredibly hard worker and, and still to this day where he's, you know, almost, I think he's turning 74 this year. I'm not sure. Or 75. Um, he's working very hard and he doesn't like to, you know, um, sit around. He doesn't like to kick his feet up. I will tell you that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to apologize to this guy. I can't remember his name, but there was a guy, anytime I was posting my articles online, he was commenting again and again and again, will this be a DVD? Will this be a DVD? I'm sorry, I can't remember your name now, but will this be a DVD? <laughs> oh, of the songs you know by heart? Could it? I think it could. I don't know. I think... Um, I think they're now dealing with the album, which they're really excited about. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think, you know, I hope that there's sort of a compilation at some point so that people can watch them. Um, I think they'll, I would imagine they'd cover DVD and online, but not, nothing has been confirmed to my knowledge, but I'd imagine when it is, they'll announce it, but I don't have, um, that much involvement on that side, but yeah, I, I would, I would hope, I hope that there is a DVD to give a shorter answer. (laughs) Well, thanks for mentioning the CD, and for everybody out there, that's going to be out on November 20th, I believe. So that's pretty cool. It inspired a a CD and a T-shirt, which I saw. Yeah, I saw David Portnoy of Barstool Sports walking around wearing that thing. Um, Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, (laughs) this (laughs) – I saw that on Twitter. I I think that this – you, to give credit where credit's due, I think, you know, like the origin of this project and, you know, from t- the Twitter situation, you know, Dylan and Rob, who both work for my dad and they deal with the t-shirts as well and have been working tirelessly with that. It was like they have had, and as well as Chase, who was the editor of the projects, it was sort of like a four-man operation, but they have been working tirelessly um, on this and on the album and on the t-shirts. So I have luckily been able to, you know, add a little bit of creativity on the film part of it. That being said, they all had wonderful notes and were incredibly collaborative and had an eye for things that I definitely was like, oh, I can't, this is like any embarrassed child would be like harshly editing their own parents (laughs) if you had to watch it over and over. And they kind of would be like, you're being too hard on your dad, which I, is the case I would I think for a lot of kids and parents mm-hmm. <laughs> um so yeah they sort of were really heavily involved in the origin of this and, and it's been a really fun project getting to work with the three of them um because they have sort of carried it into um this the album and the t-shirts so um that was all of them I can't take any credit <laughs> but I'm happy that it's doing well and I'm happy. I I really like the shirt. So will there be a songs, you know, by don't know by heart, excuse me, possibly volume two. Um, I don't know. That's a great question. I mean, I'd love to do it. Um, I think, you know, it's, it was, I was living with my parents for a while So I had, I was with him every day and I was with my mom every day. And now that I'm sort of back on my own, it's harder for us to get um, together and, you know, record a few more, but I'd love to. I don't know, there isn't anything planned, but I mean, I wouldn't, you know, now that especially everyone's still inside and still stuck, like, I think, you know, the more content, the better. And I think he really, really wants to keep until concerts can get back going. providing fans with whether it's this or something else just you know content that keeps people entertained so that they have something to watch while I can't wait for live shows to come back but (laughs) until it's safe to do so what have you learned from this experience of directing songs you don't know by heart what what's been your biggest takeaway 
Um, I think in terms of process, in terms of, of, of from a filmmaking perspective, it's like, don't underestimate the simplicity of an iPhone and a person, right? Mm. I think I, you know, have what I've PA'd on sets with huge um, camera crews or I, you know, I've, I've worked on smaller sets and I think, you know, you become accustomed when, if you've worked on a big set to being like, we need all, oh, definitely need all this stuff to make something good. Um, but I think it certainly helps and I, <laughs> wouldn't turn down the opportunity for that but I think you know in this day and age like there's a lot you can make and do with their iPhone and you know it's absolutely people say sometimes it's not watchable I think it's totally watchable unless Mm. you're someone who's obsessive about frames or stuff Mm -hmm. like that but I think you know it's amazing that we are have this technology that allows you to just you know have your cell phone and you can film something like that so I think for process it was that and I think you know in terms of like a personal lesson I I learned a lot about my dad that I didn't know um you know and I think it was the silver lining of this pandemic it was spending time with my family and I think specifically you know sitting down in a room and asking him specific questions and I think I said this you know when I was talking to to Dan and Hakey as well that you know the the biggest um you know, reward for me during this was just sort of like, you know, I didn't know my mom wrote songs. She mm-hmm. never told me. <laughs> he never told me. So like, that was pretty exciting to um, learn and learn in live time and be able to call her. And she generally can give a great response off the cuff. So fortunately, I had her wit in my back pocket <laughs> as well, knowing that she wouldn't disappoint. But I think, you know, learning things about my parents and and I continue to do so I think this being with them constantly has accelerated that and it's something I I don't think I'll ever get to have again so I've appreciated the time I've spent with both of them Hmm. I want to point to a picture here that's a a, so I can't fully let me see can't fully see it I'm gonna try this is a painting I got all these wires everywhere. Okay, let me see. I still can't see it. Hold on. I'm sorry. This Don't is, worry about it. It's just, it I, I, think, I know there's a I limit with would, this. You can kind of see it. I can kind of see it now. <laughs> I'll email you a picture of it. Okay. But there's a reason that I decided to bring up that picture. Yeah. That is a painting that someone gave me of the late Frank Sinatra Jr. And I, he he really affected my life. He was somebody I got to interview and got to know a little bit. And he had this very, very famous last name, Sinatra. And I always felt, and a lot of people who knew him, they always felt like in some ways that name was like a blessing and a curse for him. Do you think that fame is more of a blessing or more of a curse? Yeah, well, um, I think that so that's a great question. Um, I think that, you know, it's a blessing and that it opens up so many doors for people. But I think once you get in those doors, you kind of have to watch your step hmm. because I think that it can have negative effects on people's lives but I also think the most important thing that I've seen and obviously I I I think having grown up around it and myself not being famous is uh just a by proxy situation and observing is I think like having a strong sense of self and Mm. sort of family and friends is huge because I think even when people make it, there's always this feeling it might go away. And like, what if it does go away and you put all your eggs in that basket and forgot to put the eggs in the family, friends, Mm -hmm. everything else basket. So I think, I think it is the classic. And I think people have said sometimes a double-edged sword, but again, like 
I think it's hard to often complain because it affords so much privilege and opportunity to people. Hmm. Um, so when people do complain about it, you know, I think for me, I specifically, I've always wanted to separate myself from my dad in terms of my work, but I also I'm completely aware that a lot of the doors I've gotten into are because of him. So I think it's recognizing and having a self-awareness of how you got to a certain place, right? But also realizing like, now that I'm here, like I need to prove that I deserve to be here because mm. there are many other people that should be in this position that I have gotten, been fortunate enough to be here because of who my father is. So I think it's just recognition and constantly being grateful and knowing that like, you can be afforded opportunities that people would never get in a lifetime, but it's, it's appreciating them and knowing how to use them for good as well. And I think when people use fame for good, that's like, you know, you can't argue that because I think we live in a celebrity obsessed culture. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of it is super unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. But I also think it's raised an awareness for issues that we would have, people would have never gotten to raise awareness for, you know, across the spectrum of social issues. Um, so I think it's a tough question because I do, again, I think it is a double-edged sword, but, um, you know, I, I relate to the Sinatra Jr. thing probably, but, you know, like I, I can't complain because mm -hmm. I am grateful for the life that I've been able to lead. Um, and sure, I get feelings like, you know, like anyone does of, of anxiety or like, oh, like, what, like, you know, maybe people will think I never, I don't deserve this, but they probably should think that in certain <laughs> ways, right? And like, mm -hmm. I can't complain because I have been afforded opportunities in life that people don't get. And so I like to be aware of that. And I think it's, I think keeping a good head on your shoulders and having self-awareness and a sense of self can often help with the issue of fame and, or, you know, being in the public eye. Great, great. Very intelligent answer. Thank I'm you. glad I asked. <laughs> I was trying. Well, one time I remember Frank, God rest his soul. He was on uh, he was on some TV show. I think he was, it was on a Canadian show and they asked him, they said, you know, was it, what, being a singer named Frank Sinatra, what, you know, was that good, bad, what? And he said, well, you know, I could take a piece of paper and I could write on one side all the reasons that that was a blessing. And on the other side, all the reasons that that was a curse. Yeah. And guess what? My name would still be Frank Sinatra. <laughs> and I thought, okay, home run, Frank. <laughs> but Home run. That's yeah. better than I, I wish I, I wish I had said that instead of <laughs> talking for five minutes. So no. I wish I had that in my back pocket, but. What you said was very good. What is the most memorable email you ever got? I, I, I was thinking about this actually. Yeah. And I struggled because I also, I talked to my friend before this because we were working together. Um, and it's. I think it was from, it was from, um, a friend and I was complaining to them about, I wanted to sit, think of something simple, but then I was like, no, this email always pops up in my mind. So I have to say this one. Um, it was about from a friend and I had just seen him and he said, I was complaining about something. I was complaining about probably about a script or something or something getting rejected. Um, and how I just sort of like was just hoping to get to that next step in terms of like, if I just got here, you know, the classic, then everything would be okay. Um, and he just sent me this really long email back after I'd seen him. And it was about like, yeah, I remember you telling me at dinner that you thought you hadn't really made anything or, you know, you hadn't gone to that step yet, but like, I just want you to like stop and, you know, take a second and look at everything that you've done. And most importantly, appreciate the people that you've done it with. And then reassess that answer, whether you think that you've made something of yourself or not. 
And it was much more eloquently put than that. But I remember being like, like, wow, that is so true. And I think I sometimes think back on that when I start to be ungrateful or like complain or be a brat. I I think (laughs) back on that email and, and I think, you know, the most important thing to me as cliche as this sounds in my life when it boils down to it is my family and my friends. And so I think it's really that email stuck with me because I'll think about it and it reminds me to appreciate them daily because fortunately I have amazing friends and longtime friends and I have a very supportive family. And I think, you know, it's become more obvious how much it means to me um, during this pandemic too, because I think having their company has been um, very comforting. So yeah, that's be the, a long answer. I wanted to say like, oh, it was this email I got from X and it was really funny, but that would be the one that definitely sticks out to me. Mm. You know, it, uh, I want to tell all the viewers and listeners out there that you've made a number of different documentaries, including about the, uh, I think it's Wiki Wachi. Yeah. The Mermaids. There's the City of Angles, which is a series mm-hmm. of comedy s- skits, which I've watched a lot of those many, many times. Thank you. <laughs> you and might be the main view on those. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I might be. But <laughs> you have a, a very, very diverse number of things that you have made in terms of documentaries, from people who pretend to be mermaids, to uh, the, the town that has the brothel, to all these different things. What is the documentary you'd like to make? Maybe a dream documentary. Oh gosh. What's interesting is I, I, I haven't thought about them because I've taken a step back from, from the doc world a little bit because I've been focusing on writing, but like, I, I think I'm trying to, I think that like, there isn't a specific topic. Oh, look at your dog. That's the neighbor's dog. Oh, <laughs> I was <laughs> kind say, of my dog right now. Dog. Um, I can't, uh, to be really honest, I can't think of a specific topic, but I will say that the only documentaries I've done are short documentaries. And I think I would love to do a long form documentary. I think the best documentaries, you know, one time my friend said to me, the best documentaries are are something that, a documentary that focus on something small and use that to reflect a larger issue. Um, So I think I would love you know, I think the things that I love in short documentaries, I like, again, characters. I like people. I like people who are able to sort of tell the story for itself. Because I, I I don't think it's fair to insert my voice in um, a lot of the stories that I tell. So I think I would love to find something, um, a place or a person or a story that enables me to sort of shed light on a larger issue and that's so broad but I just think that like again the best thing about documentaries nowadays is that they can you know uncover problems in areas or things you wouldn't know about or just stories of people who are so great and doing wonderful things that are untold and so I would love to find like an untold story of a person who's making a huge impact that sort of reflects on a larger issue. Um, because I think that's important right now. And I think the best way to get people to listen is a compelling character. Hmm. So I'm sorry, I didn't have a specific no. answer for you. but So for not just this series, the songs you don't know by heart, but all of the films that you make, what is it that you hope that the viewer gets from that? Um, I think and I, there's someone who said a better, more eloquent quote about this than I do. I, I, so I mainly am trying to write comedy. And I think, in my opinion, like, this sounds so cheesy, but <laughs> I do think laughter is the best medicine. Mm-hmm. And I think it also... I love watching things. And I think this is like the funny, weird, again, twisted part of the internet is sometimes it does make you feel a lot less alone. Yeah. And I think when you watch something, um, I would hope that I can 
I want to make something that can provide some sort of comic relief, but also, and also make someone feel less alone in the world, whether, you, you know, one of my favorite movies ever is Forgetting Sarah Marshall. And mm-hmm. the reason I like it is because one, I think it's one of the funniest movies I've ever seen, but two, it makes you feel like, oh my God, like that's, everyone goes through breakups and, you know, everyone goes through those steps and feels those things. And I think what it did so brilliantly was, you know, hit it so hard with the comedy, but also bring some sort of human, like human and like heartfelt moments. And so I hope to make something that's, you know, funny, but just makes people feel like, okay, I'm not alone. Like, wow. Like also not only am I not alone, but like, it's pretty funny sometimes, you know, um, which is something that I need a lot of the time. So I think I hope to, um, be able to make something the way that other people have made things that I admire that sort of evoke that feeling. Hmm. Nice. I like that. Well, my last question, you've been very generous with me as last <laughs> time you, you've given me a lot of time. I really appreciate it. Of course. We have people tuned in from all over the world. I have no doubt. This is very open-ended. You have the stage. What would you say to anybody who's joining us in closing? Who's joining us? Yeah. Oh, I'm bad with the broad questions, but I'm going to try to think of something concise. (laughs) Just need a second. In closing. I guess, I don't know. I guess I would say like one, like if they tuned into Songs You Don't Know by Heart, thank you to everyone who watched that and... I appreciate it and I appreciate it all the kind words and I don't know I think if we're on the topic of that I think you know what I what I took away from that project and what I think people liked about the project was the familial aspect to it so I think you know we're all a lot of people are sort of stuck right now and I think you know again the silver lining for everyone is maybe you got a little bit more time to dedicate to the people you care most about in your life. And I hope that people are able to do that, whether it's a phone call or a FaceTime or dinner. Um, I think it's a nice time to catch up with people and sort of learn new things about family and friends that you might not have had the time to before. Very well put. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Delaney. I really Thank appreciate you so much it. for having me. It was, those are amazing questions and I had such a nice time. Well, thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I've watched 143 movies this year. So. Wow. (laughs) Get to, get to work. I gotta get to work. I have to get to work. (laughs) Well, say hello to Katie for me. I will. Yeah. I really appreciate it. And I hope we talk again. Yes. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful day. Night. All right. (laughs) Bye. I'll see ya. See ya. Bye-bye.